Um, and our first talk will be with Arkane Sain, um, talking about Affine's metric spaces with two Jordan and the class group of unit management and curriculum. Hey, thanks, uh, Wayne, and thanks for the organizers for the invitation. Um, so I'll let you speak here. And uh, okay, yeah, so <clears throat> I'll talk a bit about my work uh, that's joined with Iman Sataye, Sharon Shankar, and Ashwin Swaminathan um, on computing uh, class group averages in very thin families um, using some new. And so um, <clears throat> before we start with the arithmetic statistics, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by describing this tool. And this tool doesn't require a lot of background and it's, it's really um, something that's kind of like the workhorse of the method. Um, so I'll spend a bit of time to explain how you can sort of extend or, or use different results to replace this workhorse. And so I'll go through the tool in detail, then I'll go through the heuristics sort of which they're applied, and then, and then I'll talk about how to apply this tool. So here's the plan. I'll talk about Davenport's lemma, um, counting in hyperbolic spaces with effective error term. Um, and then I'll describe some background about the coin monster heuristics. I think it's a beautiful story and something uh, that's quite easy to explain, I think. Um, and then, and then I'll, I'll talk about how, uh, how to find an application for these effective counting results um, to, to the case of uh, coin lens for sort of heuristics over thin families. So, so Davenport Slama. So um, Davenport Slama is a statement um, about the number of integral points in regions of Euclidean space. So suppose you have a circle or a sphere in, in R3, let's say, and you try to count the number of um, points that all have integer coefficients. So those are those form a lattice. Um, and Davenport's lemma tells you how to express this number of, of points within the sphere um, in terms of a formula involving volumes. So you have a count and you replace that by a volume computation. That's nice because you can do integration when you have volumes, and so it's, it's a link between the sequence. Um, so something discrete to something continuous. Um, and here's the statement. So the statement is that if you have some bounded semi-algebraic region, so like a sphere, for example, um, <clears throat> the number of integral points contained in this region is uh, approximately equal to the volume, but you also have an error, and the error is sort of explicitly described. So it's an error that's at most this quantity here. And this quantity is the max over all the E bars of the one in the volumes of E bars. And what are these E bars? So the projection of the actual regions, uh, the actual region E onto the coordinate uh, subspaces. So if you look at a sphere in R3, you can look at the projection of the sphere onto the, the planes and onto the lines and look at the volumes there, right? So the volume of a projection of the sphere onto a plane would be just the area of the circle and the volume of the projection onto the line would be the area of that, uh, that uh, of that interval, um, <clears throat> and, and that bounds your error, okay? So, so it's a very sort of uh, explicit statement in terms of the error you actually get. Um, and so I don't wanna go through a proof of this because um, I think the proof is not super enlightening, but, but I'd like to describe why this theorem should be true conceptually. And there's actually a very nice and easy explanation for this um, that sort of tells you sort of what phenomena are involved in. It's, it's quite nice and so I'll go through it. So how would you sort of naturally try to prove something like this, right? Um, you would do like you, like you were thought in grade school when you were trying to estimate volumes, you could like just count little tiles, right? One by one little squares. And that would give you sort of the volume that's contained or an approximation to the volume contained in the region. And if you identify the lower left-hand corner of those little squares with lattice points, right? This would be a count. And this works pretty well, um, except that you have errors near the boundary. So um, what you do is you tile Rn with translates of a fundamental domain for Zn for this lattice. So in R2, this looks like this. You get a um, Z2 lattice here. And um, you identify each lattice point, right, with sort of uh, the lower left-hand corner of a fundamental domain. So you associate these two things. And those are going to be your tiles. So you heard a lot about tilings this morning, but much, much simpler. So, um, and then if you look at the number of integral points inside E, it's approximately equal to the volume because what do you do? Well, you count all the lower left-hand corners, little tiles, except that sometimes, so each tile has area or volume one. And so you get a nice correspondence, except that you have edge effects. 
So in other words, the tiles that intersect the boundary are not going to lie entirely with an E, and so they're going to contribute only a fraction of their uh, unit volume to the actual volume of E. Okay, so if we if we zoom in a little bit into this picture, um, we can actually quantify this this error sort of explicitly. So um, we have a region E here. So a nice circle on R2, we have our origin here, and we're identifying each tile. So this tile, for example, is identified with a point zero zero. Right? So there's going to be a right now. We do this for each tile here. And then we count the number of tiles. So what's N of E? Well, it's the number of points inside the region. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And what's the volume? Well, it's going to be the volume of all these little pieces of tiles here. And sometimes you have whole tiles like here, like that, right? And so when we try to estimate the error, so we look at the number of um, integral points, right, inside E minus the volume, well, what do we get? Each tile, right, that's completely within E contributes one here because its left-hand corner is an E also, right? And, it's, and it contributes also, that tile also contributes a volume of one, and so they cancel in this difference. On the other hand, if you look at tiles which overlap the boundary, right, there are two cases. There are the case where, there's the case where the lower left-hand corner is actually outside of the, of the region. And in this case, it doesn't contribute to this piece here. But if you have a piece of the volume which does contribute, a piece of the tile which does contribute to the volume here. And so you, you add that, that missing piece of the volume with a negative sign to here. And on the other hand, you also have uh, the tiles which overlap the boundary and whose left-hand corner is inside, so they contribute a one to here, but the whole tile doesn't actually contribute a whole volume, right? And so you have to add this piece of the volume of the tile. And so in total, the error um, sort of looks like, if, if, if you want, sort of, you can complete this picture and draw these little things here. And the error is going to be exactly uh, the sum over all these things with signs, right? Um, and you can cover this thing by thickening the boundary by the diameter of the actual tile. And that's going to be a bound for your error. Okay. And so what you can do is you can just uh, very roughly bound this, this error by this volume. So it's the volume of the boundary of E thickened by uh, here uh, a ball of, uh, well, thickened by, um, by root two. So sort of you can imagine the boundary and you look at it. Uh, the neighborhood that's sort of a tubular neighborhood of the boundary uh, at radius two. And, and that's going to be an error for, for your volume. Okay. <clears throat> and so you can actually use this expression now, right? This little uh, thing we've done to, to bound the error term in Davenport's lemma. And if you do that, um, you see that it actually explains the error term in Davenport's lemma. So Davenport's lemma is quite easy if you, if you look at it this way, because um, what does it do? So this, this boundary plus this little ball is like a tubular neighborhood of the boundary. Okay, so it's a thickening of the boundary, and it only remembers the large dimensions. <clears throat> and so if you want, this kind of explains uh, the error term. So I'll do some examples where that'll make it clearer. So in the first example, we'll take uh, a simple situation where we have a rectangle um, centered at uh, sort of a rectangle a square prism sort of uh, along the x-axis that has a length x and two edges of length one over root x. So all of these guys, when x goes to infinity, all, they all have volume one, okay? Um, but as x goes to infinity, these edges get smaller and smaller. And so they get very, very close to just the axis. So the only integral points that are actually contained in this is the x-axis. So the number of integral points is about x, right? The length of that, that thing. So if you look at the volume of E, it's one for all X. But if you look at this term in this error term in Davenport's lemma, the max of the projections, you can see that the max, maximum projection you'll get is just an interval of length X. Okay, because um, if you project into um, to planes, you'll get something that has area root X. Um, and so that's still smaller. Um, but what if we look at our, the, the thing we thought about, uh, this thickening of the boundary? Well, if you thicken the boundary, what happens? Well. <clears throat> you have to you have to add some some little ball, and so these dimensions here become just bounded from below, right? By some by some bound root two plus some epsilon, and and and, and this just becomes something like x plus root two, and so you just get a cube where you forget about the small dimensions, and you compute the volume, and you see that it's uh, a 
approximately x. Okay. Um, and so this is a very geometric way of, 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 of even finding the error term in Davenport's lemma. Um, and you can look at a, at a classical problem in the plane, which is a Gauss's circle problem. And I'm going to give you this example to emphasize that we did something uh, pretty rough when we, when we bounded the error by this. We forgot about the signs. Right? Um, and so in Gauss's circle problem, the, the, the problem, so this is an old problem, and the problem is to find the number of integral points in a ball of radius r centered at the origin in R2. And if you look at Davenport's lemma, um, what we did, uh, we get that this is approximately equal to the area of that ball plus uh, an error term, which is like the maximum projection, right? In this case, well, that would be just uh, something like the radius, okay, or twice the radius. Um, <clears throat> But in fact, uh, we can do something better. If we use Poisson summation, so that'll take into account the cancellations of the signs that we saw. So the red, so before we had uh, some red and some green tiles, but we forgot about the signs to, to, to write this error term. So if you do the Poisson summation, you can get some cancellations. If you get, and if you, if you do something uh, like this, you'll get an error term that's better. It's R to the two thirds. And in fact, um, it's conjectured that the truth uh, should actually be that you get even more cancellations than you should get r to the oops, sorry. You should get r to the one half, and that's still that's still an open problem. Okay, so um, so you see, um, getting these cancellation results can be can be can be quite hard to, to actually get exactly the amount of cancellation you want. And so the point is, um, when we apply Davenport lemma in practice. Um, it's useful because the volume of a region is usually bigger uh, than the volume of a thickening of the boundary. Okay. Uh, so in a lot of the applications of Davenport-Slama to arithmetic statistics or to number theory in general, um, the point is you want to apply Davenport-Slama in, uh, in situations or you want to count in situations where you're in Euclidean space. Because in Euclidean space, usually if you have a region that gets larger and larger, the boundary or the surface area is, all, is usually smaller than the volume. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but there are a lot of interesting arithmetic problems where this is not the case. And we'd like to count those. So now I'll explain what happens in a different geometry. So, so counting in hyperbolic spaces. So here's a situation where um, the volume of a, of a thickening of the boundary is usually of the same order of magnitude as the volume of the actual uh, um, region. Um, so let's look at an analog of Gauss's circle problem. So the simplest thing you can look at, a sphere of radius r centered at the origin, and you try to count the number of lattice points in there. So what would happen if we tried to do the same thing? Our argument's pretty general. It works in any geometry. The argument we made to, to bound the volume, right? Just tile stuff. So that's fine. But the problem is here is that the thickening is, is, is not a right order. So you can think of hyperbolic space as uh, the one carry disk. So it's the unit circle in R2 with a funny metric. And the funny metric is given by this. So things get sort of, uh, the distances that, that you see sort of get smaller as, as, as you get closer to the edge. So, so, so they get bigger. So lengths, lengths increase like, uh, as you get closer to the edge of the circle. Um, <clears throat> and so if you actually do a computation here in hyperbolic geometry, you can see that if you look at the volume of a ball of radius r centered at zero versus its bound, the, the, so the volume of the boundary is about uh, two pi, hyperbolic sine of r, uh, and the volume of, of, of the actual ball is four pi. And these two things look like some constant times e to the r. So the main term is about the same as the error term. Um, and so our previous approach will actually fail because if you take a thickening of the boundary, you'll get something that's of the same order of magnitude. And so you won't be able to differentiate to the main term of the error term. Um, and so in order to get a good result, we need to be careful with a crude distribution near the boundary. We need to be able to remember the signs a little bit, okay? Or if you want whether a tile, whether the left-hand corner of a tile is within or without the region, approximately the same amount of time. Okay. <clears throat> and so I'll describe a um, uh, sort of this counting. So, a situation where this counting was done uh, that comes from our Goulas' thesis. And my presentation will follow by Stan McMullen and I'll explain how um, you can actually use equidistribution results to get uh, sufficient, sufficient cancellations um, to say something interesting in hyperbolic geometry. 
So um, this follows a scheme like Mullen. And so you take your hyperbolic plane um, and you have some hyperbolic surface, which will be like our tile. So it's the hyperbolic plane modulo some, some group, which would be kind of like Zn, let's say. Um, and this would be some lattice. Um, and then you take two points in the hyperbolic, in hyperbolic space. You look at the ball of radius R centered at uh, Fp. And you want an asymptotic for the number of points in translates of some point H. So this would be gamma times V would be like Zn um, <clears throat> inside this ball of radius R. So this is exactly the analog of Gauss's circle problem, but for hyperbolic space. And um, here I'll tell you how the uh, how you do. So in order to, to count in hyperbolic space, you want a setup that's a bit uh, more precise than what we use because we want to take into account cancellations. And if you remember cancellations, well, we have, you know, we have some positive things when the left-hand corner was on one side and on the other side, but you also want to take into account how close to the boundary, right, to this left-hand corner is because that remembers how far the, the tile overlaps. So in order to be very careful with cancellation, we introduce this bump function. So this smooths out our count. So we have a bump function on sigma, okay, a hyperbolic surface or a tile of integral one supported on this little ball around, around V, okay? So this is like looking at uh, a lattice and putting a little bump function around every integral point. Um, <clears throat> we look at this pullback of alpha to H. So it's like pulling it back uh, after lattice, the entire space Rn. And beta sub R will be the push forward of the indicator of this ball to the actual, uh, to the actual tile. So we're localizing everything we count to the tile, really, because we want to look at cancellations. <laughs> And uh, so, so here's the argument. So if you do uh, a smooth tiling argument like we did before, right, to count the number of lattice points, um, you look at the number of lattice points uh, in a ball of radius R minus epsilon. That's going to be less than, I remember alpha is supported as your, alpha is supported in a ball of, of radius epsilon. So here, this count is going to be less than the integral over BPR of alpha twiddle but over this, this ball of a slightly bigger radius. Okay. That's just because, because our ball has radius epsilon and we can do this. Um, now you can do just uh, do a chain of variables and you get this guy here. So it's the integral over a tile of alpha times beta r. And beta r is just a function which remembers sort of how often a point in DPR, uh, how often a point in the tile lies in DPR, the actual ball. Um, and that's gonna be less than or equal to n to the r plus epsilon. And now here's the where the magic happens. Um, you have that um, this ball of radius R is foliated by spheres, okay, or by circles. And um, <clears throat> there's this very nice result that comes from from dynamics that you can use now. Um, and what it says is that if you have a function on on your tile, a continuous function on your tile, um, the average of of that function over the entire tile. Uh, Sorry, the average of that function over spheres of growing radius is actually equal to the uh, tens to the average value of alpha over the tile. Okay, and so using that argument, what you can do is you can you can evaluate this limit as the as r goes to infinity, just because uh, br uh, or bpr is foliated by spheres, and you actually get that that tends to the average to the area of the ball over the area of the tile. And that's about the number, and so there that implies that the number r, um, so n r, so the number of elements in that, in that ball of radius r times this area actually lies within this thing. And so you can take epsilon to be uh, to, to, to tend to zero, and so that tends to one, and so you get that n r actually tends to the area of the ball over the area of the tile, which is exactly the analog of a result from before. And so in pictures, what this gives is. Um, <clears throat> You get cancellations because of vector distribution. So if you look at our tile, like a hyperbolic tile, um, we have alpha little bump function here. And then the equidistribution is like uh, the boundary of these spheres sort of equidistributing exactly uh, on both sides of alpha. And so this is a general results in dynamics for um, that holds in, in, in a lot of spaces that have negative curvature. Um, and so, in fact, there's this bigger tool that we can use. We don't have to be restricted to um, Euclidean space. We can, we can count in geometries that are a bit more general. Um, so there's an effective form of this counting 
uh, that's done for affine symmetric spaces, so a more general class of spaces than hyperbolic space or finite space. Um, and these hyperbolic, these affine symmetric spaces are quotients of the form G mod H, where G is a Lie group, um, some conditions, and H is a closed subgroup, which is the fixed point of an involution. Okay. So, um, so, yeah, affine symmetric spaces uh, shrub the nature a lot. Okay, so you might think, uh, well, I, you might think you came to talk in a number theory, so I'll, I'll start talking a bit more about number theory. And so this is the main tool I'm going to use. Now we'll talk about number theory and it'll get interesting. And then I'll, I'll tell you how to apply this tool to problems in number theory. Okay, so um, are there any questions before I proceed? Okay, so, um, so Cohen Lenstra. The Cohen Lister heuristics. So, um, <clears throat> so first I'll introduce the objects that are actually uh, uh, that this heuristics deals uh, deals with, um, and, then, and then I'll tell you uh, what philosophy um, sort of underpins it. So, you start with a number field K. So you can think finite extension of Q, like a quadratic, like the, the Gaussian Gaussian numbers, Q or join I, um, <clears throat> and you let OK be its ring of integers. Um, you define an invariant, which is called the class group. So it's the quotient of the fractional ideals of OK by the principal fractional ideals of, of, of OK. And so um, the words aren't super important, but, but, but somehow it's a, it's a finite abelian group that measures how far OK is from having the unique factorization property. So in general, um, ring of integers will need to have unique factorization, right, for more general number fields than, uh, than Q. Um, and so this is an algebraic invariant that actually measures how far away you are. So as an example, if you look at, whoops, typo. So Q adjoined the square root of minus five, its ring of integers is Z adjoined square root of minus five and unique factorization does not hold for this uh, ring of integers. So for example, we can factor six in two different ways. Um, but in fact, uh, its class group has order two, okay? And uh, to give you another idea of how this invariant sort of tells you how far away you're, you are from having unique factorization, um, there's this theorem of Carlos that says that a number field has class number at most two, if and only if uh, every decomposition of an, of, of an algebraic integer um, is not a unique product of irreducible, right? But it's a, it's a product of irreducibles. Uh, every, every way you write X is a product of irreducibles, all of these ways have to have the same length. So somehow, it's like the next best thing to have a unique factorization. You have uniqueness of length of factorization. It's really an invariant that then measures this, this guy here. <laughs> and so um, this object is actually has a long, long history and is still quite mysterious. Um, and so it kind of starts with Gauss uh, um, in some sense uh, that asks some of the first questions about, um, about this invariant. So for example, if you look at quadratic fields, um, how many of them have class number one, which is equivalent to having unique factorization? Um, and also, are there infinitely many? Um, so it turns out that for that for sort of uh, number fields, um, for, so even for quadratic fields, uh, this is quite a hard question. So for for imaginary quadratic fields, it took about 100, 150 years to actually solve this question and to get the answer. And only finally many imaginary quadratic fields that have class number one that have unique factorization. But if you look at real quadratic fields, we actually still don't know. So that's, that's still uh, totally open. Um, <clears throat> so even for, for sort of the simplest degree, these, these things are quite mysterious. Um, and we can ask even more ambitious questions, right? Uh, that go beyond what Gauss asked. We can, we can ask, um, since it's a finite abelian group, we can ask with what frequency um, any finite abelian group appears as a class group of a number field or whether all of them appear, whether every single finite abelian group is a class group of a number field. And um, <clears throat> this is very, very mysterious. So we don't know if, that every uh, finite abelian group shows up as a class group of some number field. And in fact, we don't know of one that shows up infinitely often. Somehow it's a, still, still a, a very mysterious uh, object. Um, but in modern times, uh, people have, um, so we started making progress on, on, on what we should expect um, by sort of thinking of the class group as a, 
as a, as a random object, if you want, or as a random variable. And so here's the setup um, to explain what the dream is. So you fix a degree n and a signature r1, r2. So for example, quadratic fields that are all real could be yeah, a setting. And you fix a prime, uh, which doesn't define the, uh, which doesn't divide the degree. And, it, and you look at the sort of the, the p primary part of the class group, OK? Sort of a class group decomposes of, as a product of cyclic groups, right? Um, <clears throat> because it's finite dealing group. And those cyclic groups have uh, um, have order which are powers of primes. Uh, and you look at just the part of it that's a power of this prime p. And now you look at this distribution, you, you treat the class group as a random variable. In other words, you, you look at the class group as a random variable that comes from some space, number of fields of a, a fixed degree and signature, and that go into finite abelian groups, finite abelian p groups, right? Where every element is divisible by as order of power of p. So we, we, we look at this. At, this guy, the, the class group, the, the p primary part of a class group, and we want to treat it as a random variable. So what does it mean? Well, presumably it's a random variable, so we have some distribution on uh, its codomain, and this. Uh, so these things should appear sort of randomly. So in order to sort of make this dream precise that it's a random variable like this, we need to say sort of what do we consider to be a random abelian group. Okay, and so now I'm gonna I'm gonna go into the the philosophy that underpins sort of how you describe finite or, or, or random algebraic objects. So, um, so the Cohen Lester philosophy is the following. So, so it, it, it says that objects should appear in nature with frequency that's inversely proportional to the size of their automorphism groups. Okay, so in other words, if you have some object or some system that has a lot of symmetries, that should not, that's very structured. And so, um, that shouldn't occur in nature very often, right? Things that are that have sort of low entropy should be rare. That's kind of a statement. Of this. Um, and so, so as an example, I think this is quite a, a fun example to do Cohen Lenstra. Um, let's see what, what 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 sort of making this philosophy operative um, would say for the question: What is a random group? Okay, so so how would how do you find a group in nature? Um, I don't know, you go for a walk and maybe you find a multiplication table lying on the ground. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe you're lucky and you find many of them. So, <laughs> um, and, and you want to know which groups you get, okay? So, so <laughs> that's an example of making this thing operative. So set E with N elements and you have a group G of order N. And you want to know how many multiplications you find on your, on your walk uh, that, actually, that actually are isomorphic to G. So how many multiplications uh, uh, can you write down on, on, on this set that make it to the group isomorphic to G? Um, so a multiplication table, right? You, you have a bunch of elements here and a bunch of elements there. You multiply them together and you just put random elements here, okay? Um, most of these tables aren't gonna form even a group, right? Um, because you need to have inverses, you need to have identity, right? So if you need to have a, a table where like E1 just like, just, you see a, a version of this column here, for example. So things like that. Um, <clears throat> but if you look among the things that do form uh, a group, uh, you can actually say how many of them are isomorphic to G. So the trick is to look at a multiplication table for G, right? And then just replace all the names by names in E, okay? So what, what would that look like? Well, you have a bijection phi from E to G. So this would be like replacing the names and you look at a multiplication table for E and you literally write down, uh, you assign a name to each element of G and you write down the multiplication table for G with the new names. And now you count how many of those guys you get. And, and, and this gives you exactly all the multiplication tables you can write on E that are isomorphic to G, right? Because an isomorphism is just rewriting the names, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, to actually find the number, you look at the symmetric group on, on G and it acts transitively on the set of valid multiplication tables and its stabilizer has size automorphism of G. Okay, so in other words, uh, you have an action of the symmetric group, the size of the orbits, which are in bijection with a set of multiplication tables has size really uh, the size of the group as G divided by the stabilizer, right? And so the answer is that the number of multiplication tables you can write is N over N factorial over the number of automorphisms of G. So if you have two groups that have size n, you should see uh, 
you should see a group more often if it has fewer automorphisms. Okay, so this would be an example of this philosophy that's operative. And so what Cohen and Lensford do is that they say, well, our distribution on finite abelian groups should exactly be this natural distribution. A group should appear randomly with proportion inversely, with frequency inversely proportional to the size of the automorphism group. Um, and so how would you make this precise, right? Because you want to think of a random variable, but somehow you look at fields, right? And you, you treat it like that. So an example of this statement is the following. So you want to check statements of this form. If you have f, a reasonable function on finite abelian p groups, and h, a reasonable height, integrating sort of the compo uh, uh, integrating f composed of the class group over, if you want, all imaginary quadratic fields of, a, of height less than x, um, and then taking the limit should be the same thing as integrating that function over that distribution on finite abelian p groups. So this would be a, an example of this statement. And in the case of imaginary quadratic fields, this Cohen Lenstra sort of measure on finite abelian p groups um, is exactly a one over odds measure. You literally write that down and you, and you normalize it so it makes it a probability measure. So it has plus one, and that actually gives you, a, gives you the prediction. And the general case of the Cohen Lenstra heuristics called uh, Cohen Lenstra Martin Mal, and they predict sort of these distributions in a wide class of, of cases or all cases. Uh, <laughs> where the prime is good and where you're looking at the family of all uh, fields of a fixed degree and signature. <clears throat> and there's been some progress on this, um, but it's been, been slow and there are only a few, few sort of proven cases. So it's quite a hard problem. So if you look at, uh, so, so these are the cases, so better known. So if you look at three torsion and quadratic fields, um, so it would be a function that picks up just a three torsion. Um, this average three torsion has been, has been verified to follow the cohen lenser heuristics, um, cohen lenser martin mal heuristics. Um, Module Barga approved uh, um, that two torsion in cubic fields also follows it. Follows it. Um, Alex Smith proved um, that two torsion in twice the class group for quadratic fields also follows some version of this. And Ellenberg and Kitesh Westerland uh, have results in the function fields, in function field case. Um, and now, I just want to talk about a general framework. And um, so the general framework is what? Well, we, we have fields with some height, and we have some measure on this based on the height, right? We just like look at the density and then integrate that's what, that way, right? Um, and we have finite abelian p groups. And somehow we want to say that the push forward on the class group, p part of the class group of this measure, matches the natural measure of finite abelian p groups. But sometimes it's not the one over auth measure. Sometimes, even in the Cohen Lenstra Martin ML, you need to have some correction factor. This underlies some, some other structure on, on sort of the class group. And sometimes you need to have some, some extra sort of uh, category, um, some extra structure, and you're actually pushing down the natural measure, the one over auth measure from that category. And so the art comes from sort of um, figuring out what this, uh, what this extra structure is. Um, and it's something that you can get your hands on, right? Because if you look at this push forward measure, it comes from nature in the sense that you can actually sample it using a computer. So you can tell whether, whether a prediction you make here is true or not based on, based on computer simulation. And if it's, if it's not, if there's a discrepancy between your, if there's a discrepancy between what you find in the computer and what you expect, it means there's probably some extra structure you're not accounting for. And sometimes this extra structure can be quite fine. And so it's a good way of like teasing out structure out of some mysterious object, actually. Um, it goes kind of both ways. Somehow, in some cases, you shouldn't really think of the class group as just a finite abelian p group or the p part. You should think of it as something with a bit more structure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and now we'll talk about an application in the last 10 minutes of, um, of the tool I talked about counting. Uh, Effective lattice point counts for hyperbolic space to, to one of these problems. Um, so, so here, here's the setup. So, so now I'm just gonna I'm gonna tell you first what we do using effective counting, and I'll tell you what that gives us in terms of coin lens struct. So, um, so if we look at this at this following geometric setup, so we have a, uh, a set of pairs of symmetric matrices, A B, three by three symmetric matrices with an action by changing the basis of the pair of symmetric matrices by G transpose G simultaneously. Um, so we have an action by SL3. Um, <clears throat> and on the other side, we have Monica reducible cubic polynomials. So 
cubic polynomials with first coefficient and last coefficient one. You can have a height on this set of cubic polynomials, which looks like this. So it's this kind of like uh, wonky height that's, uh, you know, where it's a and the max of a and the square root of b. And um, we have a map that goes from this space to that space, which is the determinant of this polynomial, which is the determinant of ax plus ax minus b. So this gives you the polynomial. Um, and because the first coefficient and last coefficients are one, this imposes the following conditions on, on the space of pairs you're considering. The conditions are the determinant of A and the determinant of B are equal to one. Um, and with this setup, um, Madro Bargava and sort of uh, one of his celebrated uh, composition laws and, and, and that was generalized by, by Melanie Wood, um, sort of tells you that you can identify sort of two torsion in the class group in this space. So, so, so what is it? If you look at the fibers of this map over a particular cubic polynomial, it's something that's kind of like uh, a unit group modulo squares times, uh, times the size of the class group. So you can, you can get at sort of arithmetic information by counting points of a certain height in this space or a certain norm, okay? So that's what the sentence says. Um, some conditions on F need F to be maximal, and KF is just the field given by joining the roots of F or root of F to Q. Okay. Um, and so, um, just to make the setup a little bit cleaner and bring it into a form that uh, that is amenable to to applying these counting results I've been talking about, um, you look at LZ, which is a set of representatives of uh, SL3 orbits uh, on, on, on just a three by three symmetric matrix of determinant one, and there are only finally many of those. So that's an old theorem. Um, and, <clears throat> and for each A in that finite set, uh, we want to count the number of SOAZ orbits on VAZ. So, so SOA is just the stabilizer of that thing. So you fix a pair. So, so you fix the first element of the pair and you look at just all pairs acting on now by SLN that have that that first element fixed. And so that gives you a stabilizer of the special orthogonal group. And so that thing acts on the second elements of the pair. And so now <clears throat> the actual counting problem we want to solve is we want to find the number of these orbits of height at most, at, at most x and determinants one. And we call this number NAX. So now if we do some geometry of numbers, um, we can average this count here to get the following expression. So this count is actually equal to this integral here. And now we recognize something that we've been sort of dealing with. We have, um, so this part isn't really important. Okay, so this shouldn't be an equal, an equal but okay. this part shouldn't be important. So this part isn't super important, but this part is. So we have an integral over a fundamental domain of the number of points in some region skewed by elements of that fundamental domain that are also integral. So it's kind of like the thing we've, we've seen before, right? Um, so we're counting integral points in some piece of space, but inside uh, determinant one integral points. So it's like inside some variety. Okay, so, <clears throat> and so now what you wanna do is this integrand actually lies within finely many orbits of the form SL3 times B naught, where B naught is kind of like some fixed determinant one second element of a pair. And that's, that's equal really, right, to, to SL3. Um, uh, mod the special orthogonal group, right? Because if you have an orbit, it's equal to, to the group divided by the stabilizer. <clears throat> but that thing is actually not finite symmetric space. So we can use, we can tile sort of this integrand by finally many uh, affine symmetric spaces. And now we have a counting problem that looks exactly like the one we had before. Okay. So that of course, lemma wouldn't work. You really need to look at affine symmetric spaces because of this determinant one condition. And so now um, what you need to do is, is you need to do a bit more than just count in one of these. You need to, to, to figure out what this integral is. And so this fundamental domain actually has cusps sometimes. And so the skewing factor can get very large. And so if you can imagine in terms of Gauss's circle problem, you could have cases where you have ellipses where one of the axes grows a lot. And so somehow that's bad, right? For, for, for getting volume formulas and, and everything we've been talking about. And so what we need to do is we need to we need the main body that keeps this round ball, I'm gonna call this round ball, <coughs> really round. And so we actually need to cut off the cusp. So we need to divide this fundamental domain into the main body, a shallow cusp and a deep cusp. And we need to cut off 
a shallow cusp to keep this main ball, this round ball really round. Um, <clears throat> and we count the shallow cusp by hand using uh, divisor bound arguments. So we need to do some counting by hand, and then we can use sort of the effective lattice point counts. And that's because the, uh, the error term in these effective lattice point counts um, sort of depend, depend on this skewing factor sort of polynomially. OK. Um, and then the rest of the geometry of numbers that's, that comes from sort of this, uh, the method of Bargava and so forth actually adapts relatively well to the setting. And with a bit of careful choices and some work, it's, it's relatively smooth to get sort of the usual, uh, usual looking volume formulas and mass formulas you get at the end. Um, and so, um, so the main obstacle to applying this strategy more generally um, is that we don't have a systematic way of dealing with the shallow cuts. We kind of have to fiber and count things by hand. Um, but this, this method is nice because it's capable of covering cases where the circle method uh, can't really help. So our case has degree three and uh, six variables. And so that's, uh, that's outside of the reach of the circle method. Um, and so here's a theorem we're able to obtain in the end. Um, so if you look at the average number of non-trivial two torsion elements in this class group um, of monogenized cubic fields, it's actually bounded by this. Okay, so maybe that doesn't, it's not super impressive, but, but here's, here's part of the story. So I told you that if you find discrepancies in cohen lenstra it's uh, sort of an indicator of some structure that we haven't taken into account. Um, and so um, if we look at sort of uh, the table for cubic fields of these averages, average to torsion, if we look at the full family of cubic fields of a fixed signature, here we have this average, one over two to the R1 plus R2 minus one. If we look at monogenic fields, this is a result of Bhargav, Hanke, Shankar, we get something different. So there's some more structure to be taken into account for monogenic fields, it's twice. And here we have, for unit monogenized cubic fields, the result we proved, um, <clears throat> we have a, a factor of four. So somehow we have a progression in this, and um, these are called moments. And since moments sort of in this setting uh, kind of determine the distribution, this means that our theorem implies that there are distributions for, or it suggests that there are distributions for the class group, uh, which are even more exotic than those for monogenic fields or the full family of fields uh, for cohen lenstra So somehow there's a bit of structure that this uncovers that hasn't been elucidated yet. Um, yeah, so that's, thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions for Yep. Okay. This might be covered under the exercise part you were talking about. Uh -huh. Can you explain or indicate where the semi algebraicity comes into play in down for some Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see. Right. So, so suppose you. You are trying to sort of uh, understand this error term now. You can compute a volume. And since Davenport Sama has volumes in terms of projections, you'd like to use some, maybe like the inverse function theorem or something. Um, <clears throat> but when you do that, you project onto the corner hyperplanes and look at things. You want to make sure that you don't have too many slices. And semi algebra city gives you that. Can you explain the notion of size you are putting on like the space of the pair of matrices? Right, right. So, um, so the height you're putting on is you're you're pulling back the height from uh, on the from from the space here. So the notion of height here is, um, so 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 you have a so, so the height of a pair is just the height of its resolvent, so of its image on the pi. Um, but, but of course you have this action, right? So, so, so it's a height on really like equivalence classes because these equivalence classes will change this. And so when we do averaging, actually we build this fundamental domain in such a way that like the coefficients are growing homogeneously in X. So it's really kind of like a, a like, like the ball of radius X. Or something like that. I have a question. Do you yeah. have any heuristic explanation for why, like, the unit monogenized, you know, the scope one at the end should uh -huh. be um, bigger? Nothing. Like no, so, so not nothing precise yet. Uh, but somehow, um, 
I mean, you could say, you could say, for example, like, so why monogenic? So there's kind of like an explanation, I guess, a bit for monogenic because the, uh, the inverse difference is principal and it's a square. Uh, for unit monogenized, uh, I think you would look at the monogenizer and you tend to tr try to take a square root. And if you look in class field theory, this this will probably be some some candidate. And then then I, I think this is because of this. Okay, I think the square root is not ramified, so you have some chance of yeah. If there are no other questions, let's say that we'll be at the